There's something about me that you probably didn't know, and that is that I used to be the biggest Apple fanboy in the world. Like, I would seriously watch every single one of their events. I still do. Um, but I watched every single one of their events, and I was always excited about it. And if I had the money at, you know, that point in my life, I would buy as many of their devices as I possibly could. And... For the most part, I didn't have that kind of money, but I always wanted to have that kind of money. I always wanted to have, I always endeavored to be able to someday afford, like, I had this plan when I first started podcasting to buy the 2013 Mac Pro. Now, that's the little trash can thing. I wouldn't touch that thing with a 10-foot pole now, but when that first thing first came out, I thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread. I thought it was amazing. It was the future. I wanted one. Like I would, I would seriously. I'm gonna, gotta remember, I was not very old at that point, <laughs> or at least I was younger. I would go onto their website and I would buy or I would build, you know, in their configurator, the best Mac Pro I could possibly build, and just fantasize about how I was gonna one day own that computer. Like I had no real use for that kind of power at that point, and even now I really don't. But Man, did I want that thing. But now I'm a Linux user. And I no longer need the highest-end hardware or anything like that. Whenever I buy a new phone, it's always a used phone. Whenever I buy a new piece of hardware, it's usually either used or a couple generations old, at least. For example, that monitor that sits behind me in all my videos, that thing is probably 15 years old now. Like, I don't need top of the line anymore. So I have definitely transitioned away from being an Apple fanboy and an Apple apologist. Uh, but I still, like I said, watch their events and oftentimes gaze at their hardware like, man, that is really cool hardware. Like it's really, like one thing that Apple does really well is they de design hardware. They can really design hardware, right? <laughs> so what I thought I would talk about today is not how awesome Apple is, but more about how Linux could learn from Apple and Mac OS. So here are the five things that Linux and the Linux community could learn from Apple and Mac OS. Let's go ahead and jump in. So the first one, and I think that this is very important, but also not necessarily something that is ever going to really play a role in the Linux community, and that is pretty software sells. So you can argue that Mac OS is not as functional as Linux. I would argue that, and I would also say that there are many things with Mac OS that just are utter garbage. Like there's some things there that are just not good at all. But one thing that you can't deny is that their aesthetic is at least somewhat pleasing. And when you boot into a Mac for the first time and you see their design language that really does transition not only from the operating system but also into the applications that Mac OS runs, you really get the sense that things are meant to work very well together on this platform and they're supposed to all look like they're on the same platform. One of the things on Linux that you can't say is that there's a cohesive design language. There's not. Like, every application looks different, like, mildly different. Even if if you have two applications that, you know, are, do the same thing, they could look completely different. And one of the things that Linux and the Linux community and really the open source community in general has a problem with is that they're not always the best designers when it comes to apps. Usually their functionality is perfectly fine, and I would argue that in some cases, open source software is superior to anything you would get on Mac OS. But when it comes to the actual look and feel of these applications, a lot of these things are subpar when it comes to things you would find on Mac OS. And some examples of this, GIMP is a good one. GIMP is okay design. It's definitely better than it used to be like 10 years ago when it was like four different panels or something like that and it was completely unusable. But now it's better, but it still doesn't really look as nice as some of the options that you get on macOS. And I'm not even just really talking about Photoshop. I'm talking about 
other applications that you'd find on the Mac App Store. Same thing with a lot of like video editors. Caden Live is a kind of a hot mess compared to like Final Cut Pro. You know, it's just it doesn't look as well. Now, I understand from a usability perspective looks really don't matter. Like it doesn't really matter how Caden Live looks or that it's overly complicated because it works. It works really well. But when you are trying to draw in new users, one of the things that does matter is how your software looks and then consistency and sometimes the way that some Linux software and open source software looks kind of dated does play a role in how people perceive Linux. Like when you open up for example, Audacity. Like, let's just... I'll, I will show you actually Audacity right now. Audacity would look the same on Mac OS as it does here. But this is the premier audio recording software on Linux. We have other options for sure. But this is the one that most people use. And it looks like it was developed for Windows 95. You know what I mean? And it's still perfectly functional. It definitely is. But it looks old, and it's not the only example of that out there. A lot of Linux or open source software just kind of looks old. So pretty software is something that Linux could learn from, or at least open source could learn from. The next one on the list is that installation of software should be easy. And when I say easy, I mean it should be drag and drop easy. I talked about app images on the podcast this previous week, and one of the things that I said was that app images had a chance to be the way of installing software on Linux. Literally, you drag and drop it to an applications folder, and it runs. You know, that's the way it works on Mac. When you download a piece of software on Mac, whether it's whatever it is, like you download it from the web, and it just comes up on your desktop, you open up the thing, you drag into a folder, it's installed. That's the way installing software really should work, at least when you're trying to download something away from a store. When you're installing something from a store, it's different, obviously. But if you're downloading something from the web, being able to drag that application from where you downloaded it into your application folder and just having it installed, that's an amazing way of installing software. And that's the way it works on macOS for the most part and has for years. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions where there's Windows-style wizards and stuff like that. But for the most part, you download a DMG or whatever it's called. You double-click on that. It shows you a window, and it tells you what to do. Drag from here to here, and it's installed. That's awesome. And it's not hard is the thing. One of the things that's a problem on Linux is that we have 50,000 different ways of installing software. Obviously, that is an over-exaggeration. Don't message me in the comments saying we don't really have 50,000. I understand we don't have 50,000. I was being hyperbolic. It doesn't matter. We have a lot of ways of installing software, and we've tried to come up with ways that are cross-distro in order to install software better. Snaps, flat packs, app images, these are all attempts by developers to make installing software easier across distros. Like, we've tried. It hasn't always necessarily worked. Flat packs and snaps have probably come the closest But for the most part, people still rely on their distro-given package manager in order to install software. Most people do, and there's nothing really wrong with that. But from a new user perspective, that is messy. Because especially if you change distros as a new user quite often, like if you go from Manjaro to Ubuntu or back and forth, whatever, those things have different package managers. And you can't go into Manjaro and do sudo apt install. You can't go into Ubuntu and use sudo pacman dash capital S. You know what I mean? They're different things, and if you don't know that they're different things, that's going to be a hurdle for you to get past. So, installing software on Linux is a mess, and it could be better, similar to what it is on Mac OS. Uh, The next one is in a similar vein, in that one thing that Mac has done really well is created a store that is really good. Like, it has a lot of software in it. Now, I know developers have had a lot of problems with the Mac App Store over the years, and it definitely takes a lot of money from developers, and you can argue about all the flaws. Like, it definitely has flaws. I'm not saying any of this stuff is perfect. I'm just saying that the Mac App Store is a great central place to download applications for the Mac. Now, obviously, there's just one Mac OS, so they don't have a problem creating one app you know, app store and saying, here's where you get your apps. 
That's just the way to do it. When you have 300 Linux distributions, it's much harder to create a central place to download applications. Because we can't, first of all, we can't agree on anything. We, we, you know, we're never going to. We're, we're never going to all sit down and say, hey, flat packs, that's the way to go. Definitely not the way it's going to work. But we could somehow maybe come to an agreement where there is a front end that kind of accesses all the different package places like snaps and flat packs and app images like one store that just kind of works with all of those things maybe this thing could also tie into the distro centric package management systems and repositories that would allow you to then kind of have a front end that works with every distribution it would be a app store that just kind of exists on every linux distribution that could then be used to download software it looks the same it doesn't really matter where the software comes from because most users don't care just as long as they can get their software and then it just works you know they don't have to deal with having the gnome software center on ubuntu they don't have to have the elementary app store the pamac on ubuntu whatever or not on ubuntu on, on manjaro you know you have 12 different app stores they all look different they all have different functionalities some of them work better than others it's a mess having one that kind of goes across all distributions, works well with all the different backends, would be a great way of having software just, again, very easy to install. The next one on the list is that hardware really matters. One thing Apple really does well is they create fantastic hardware. And whether you like them or not, you know, especially since how they're obviously really expensive, you know, they're not definitely not for everyone, but... Even people who can't afford them or uh, have no interest really in spending that much money on something, they can still admire the fact that this hardware is really, really good. And because they own the entire software stack and the hardware stack, they allow those things to work really well together. And Linux, I don't know how they would go about doing this. Like, there are some, or at least there's one good example of a hardware manufacturer that's doing something similar than that and that's system 76 but they, they ma manufacture the hardware and they've made their own distribution to go on it they work really well together and that's kind of a good thing right one of the things we always talk about when we talk about the proliferation of the linux desktop is that in order for it to actually happen hardware needs to happen people need to be able to go into best buy or amazon or whatever and buy a piece of hardware with Linux on it. That's not something that you can really do right now. And until you can do that, Linux won't be very popular, at least in the mainstream. So hardware really does matter, but it's really more than that. Like, we have hardware vendors that make Linux hardware. Like, some of it's really very good. Some of it is pretty cheaply made because they have to source it from other companies and stuff like that. So one of the things that Apple does really well is they make really premium hardware and stuff that people aspire to own. Like, remember my story about the Mac Pro earlier in the video? People aspire to own that machine, or the new Mac Pro that looks way better. People aspire to it, and you can't really say that there's very much hardware out there in the Linux ecosystem that people aspire to. The last thing on the list is that ARM is the future, and I think that out of all the ones that I put on this list, this is the one that Linux and open source really truly already gets. Like, I think that of the vast majority of Linux distros, the maintainers of the Linux distro distros, a lot of the software and hardware vendors, they know that ARM is going to be the future of computing. Like, when you buy a computer 10 years from now, it's almost guaranteed to be an ARM-based processor of some kind. And we know that because... At least at this point in time, ARM does a fantastic job of creating mobile-worthy processors that can run desktop-class software without sacrificing things like battery life and performance. Like, you, you can buy a M1 or M2 MacBook and run everything you want to run on it while simultaneously getting battery life that extends you know, into the double digits of hours, something that you can't do with a Intel or AMD processor. It's just not possible yet. And while it's possible that Intel and AMD will get their shit together and create processors that can either mimic or surpass 
the ARM-based processors that Apple uses. It's possible. At the moment, ARM seems to be the direction where that kind of functionality is going to go. Like, if you want high performance without the power costs of the traditional processors, ARM is just way better. And it seems like it's going to continue being so for the foreseeable future. So I think that already, like I said, a lot of Linux distros, they have ARM versions, and they've worked to make their distributions and the Linux kernel and all this stuff work on ARM. It works really well. Like things like you could buy a Raspberry Pi and run a full-fledged Linux distribution on there, and as of right now, it's almost so good you can actually use that as a daily driver. It's not quite there yet, but another generation or so, and who knows, you could use a Raspberry Pi as your daily computer. It could be possible. So we know that from a software standpoint, Linux distributions are at least thinking about how they can make their distributions and Linux in general work well on ARM. And I think that that is a good thing. But I also think that there's a good chance that if that development doesn't speed up a little bit, that Linux could be left behind. As more and more hardware transitions to ARM, if the functionality and compatibility for Linux doesn't keep up with that speed of the hardware, it might become harder for Linux to actually run on some devices. Now, it's possible that Linux could keep up or even surpass the other operating systems that are out there in terms of ARM capability, but it's also possible that they could fall behind, and that is something that scares me just a little bit. Like, if Linux doesn't keep up with the development in order to keep ARM support there where it needs to be for the vast majority of hardware that comes out, it would be a shame because, as of right now, if you want to run Linux on a computer, you can do so. Pretty much any computer that's out there, as long as it runs an Intel or an AMD processor, you can put Linux on no problem. Pretty much any computer that has ever existed, you could put Linux on without any issue. But when it comes to ARM, there are problems because the development just hasn't been there yet for that kind of hardware support. So Linux, the Linux kernel supports a huge variety of PC hardware. That support for ARM hardware is still really small. If the pool of ARM hardware grows faster than the support the Linux kernel can give to it, that means that you could go out and buy an ARM computer, but not be able to install Linux on it. And that is a little bit scary, because if everything goes ARM in the future, and you can't install Linux on everything, like you can right now with Linux on everything that is Intel and AMD, then... Where, where does that leave Linux? You know, it's kind of out in the cold. Some of that is paranoia. I will just put that right out there right now, but it's just something that I worry about just a little bit. If ARM continues to be the thing and Linux doesn't keep up that hardware support that it's known for, what are we all going to do? You know, so anyway, so those are the f five things that Linux and open source can learn from Mac OS and Apple. And I'm sure there are other things. And I should just put this out there. I'm not saying you should go buy a Mac or an Apple a product of any kind. In fact, I think that the that Apple has a lot of flaws when it comes to privacy and being a monopoly. You know, they have many flaws. And Mac OS definitely is not perfect. It has many flaws. I would not use it. You know, that's the thing. Is like, despite my admiration for some of the things that Mac OS does... I wouldn't use it. I love Linux. I want Linux to have some of the things that Mac OS has. Uh, I think w we could do well with emulating some of the things that Apple does. But also, Linux is free and open source software. And I wouldn't want the future of Linux to be anything but free and open source. So I wouldn't want them to completely adopt the Apple way of doing things. That would be horrible and it would make me not want to use Linux anymore. So I don't want anybody out there to think, well, Matt's an Apple fanboy. He wants Linux to become like the Mac, uh, and uh, I'm going to unsubscribe from his channel now. Uh, that's not 
at all what I'm saying. So I hope that's not the way this video came off. If you have comments about this kind of thing, you can leave those in the comment section below. You can follow me on Twitter and tweet at me there if you want. Uh, at the LinuxCast is the handle there. If you want to follow me on Mastodon or any of my other social media networks, you can find those links in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Just like these fine people who have supported me well over the last year and a half or so, I really truly do appreciate Every one of you who have supported me through Patreon and the YouTube membership thing that is below the videos and stuff like that. There's a few of you who do the, the YouTube thing. I do appreciate all of you guys as well. So everybody who supports me, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.